Hey everybody, it's Hill Harper, and it is so great to be here uh, with you uh, for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law's 20th Annual A. Leon Higginbotham Gala. I'm Hill Harper, and I'm so proud to serve as the national spokesperson for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, one of our nation's oldest and leading civil rights organizations. You know, I know that uh, we're coming into your to your home. Uh, for this gala, and we're all looking for fun things to do, uh, and jumping on your computer, because I'm sure all of you are on Zooms all the time, is maybe, maybe doesn't lead the list. But I want to tell you, this should lead your list, because today um, is is so special. And I, and I don't know about you, but seeing all those images of, of John Lewis, you know, our, our, our national treasure from last year's gala is, uh, is so inspiring. You know, uh, what he represented, the idea of getting into good trouble, the idea of, I know that he was arrested over 40 times before he was in Congress, and I believe he was arrested five or six times while he was a sitting member of Congress, and the commitment that he made to social justice, to civil rights, civil rights under the law, what he has done to fight for so many, and the fact that this these pictures are from last year and it just it, it just fills your heart and and i'll say you know folks share this link you know invite people to this evening um right now this is very this is very important invite your friends for this discussions and what folks are going to say i mean 
just just from the standpoint of one, you know, one of the many things, there are two women on this program, two women of color on this program who were uh, on the short list for uh, for becoming a, a vice presidential nominee, uh, which is pretty incredible. And uh, and that's right. We have Keisha Lance Bottoms, mayor uh, of Atlanta. It's, it stood strong and, uh, with her city amongst um, all sorts of issues, um, and obviously taking a huge leadership position with COVID and with 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 social justice and and the many things. And then we have Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is a who's a hero, uh, who who boldly from the halls of Congress um, talked about comprehensive policies to address police brutality now and into the future. And so. Uh, these are these are heroes, and so if you're here with us, you're in the right place this afternoon, um, and 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 that's why uh, you still have time to bring other folks into the room. Uh, this the what we're going to talk about today, and who we're going to hear from. Uh, everybody needs to hear about it. Everybody should share in, in this, and so um, we also have uh, Nicole Hannah Jones um, who gave uh, us a much fuller perspective of history and uh, informs the disparities that are still plaguing our communities and, and much of what we see happening in communities across this country are informed by by that history. And, uh, and, and she helped a lot of folks understand what Juneteenth is and what that, what that represents as well. Um, so many amazing power. We have another powerful woman, Sally Yates, who reminds um, everyone uh, uh, to, to the, the truth matters and that the Justice Department is supposed to live up to its purpose and uphold the rule of law. And uh, she also has a good working definition of what the rule of law is. And, and, uh, and, uh, and last but not least, we have the amazing, incredible uh, 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 Kristen Clark, uh, I'll tell you, who has been a tireless champion for racial justice across our country. She's the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee uh, for the past five years. And, and when she asked me uh, to, to, to be the national spokesperson for this amazing organization um, uh, four years ago, I immediately said yes. And, and I'm proud to support this, this wonderful organization and all the work it's done in the past and what it continues to do, particularly in this critical, critical time. Um, and, and, but, but we have fellas too. Well, let's not leave them out. You know, uh, we have my man, Ben Crump. Uh, he's a fire, you know, fearless and tireless leader, a relentless champion for justice and for speaking out for folks who may not have agency or voice. And, uh, and, and he's, he, he has been fighting for, for communities impacted, um, in so many different ways, uh, uh and, and, and gives voice. And, and we have David Abney, the executive chairman of UPS, for his work in showcasing principles of diversity, equity, as well as inclusion. Um, and now, uh, I, must, I must say this, is that I'm going to turn this show over now um, to Kristen, as well as my fraternity brother, um, Roland Martin. Now, now, Roland is a man of principal substance. He's also a, a a uh, member of uh, the greatest fraternity in the world, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, of which Dr. King is also a proud member and many others. And, and so Roland represents the best of us um, and his voice and his strength and what he represents uh, for our community is, is unmatched and it's unparalleled. And, but let me just I wanna make one little public service announcement before I hand it over. Um, folks, invite people to this tonight. For the next few hours, we're going to be talking about some very important things, but we need, we need folks to see it and hear it and participate. Number two, we need folks to vote. Vote early, please. Um, but, but don't vote often. You know, it, despite what our president said, you know, uh, it's a felony uh, voting more than once. So please just vote once, but make sure that that vote gets counted. So voting early is a good thing and making sure that there are other pathways. And, and, and you can make a plan right now to, to help folks in your circle to vote. And we also have, of course, sharing the election protection hotline that we have that's 866-OUR-VOTE. That's 866-OUR-VOTE. And, and you could call it right now 
to help folks get registered, share it with other people so they can make sure that they're properly registered um, and, and getting access to absentee ballots or to figure out how, how you, you intend to actually cast your vote this election cycle. And remember, it's not just about you. It's about the people in your circle and making sure that they're voting. It's about the people in their circle. And, and all these circles tend to, to spill out, you know. Um, it, it, this is probably the most important piece of all the things that we'll talk about this evening. And I remember um, when I was a student at Harvard Law School, and I know there are a lot of lawyers on the call, and, and I, you know, I, I never got the, the benefit of truly practicing law. You know, I, I got to be a summer associate at Sullivan and Cromwell and Shadbourne and Park and at Davis Polk, and I did a little summer associate bid at, at, at a um, U.S. attorneys and, and some, some different things. So, so I got I got to do I got a little insight, but I, but you know my career never went that direction. So I never actually practiced uh, law. But I'm a huge, huge fan and a huge supporter of all you amazing lawyers. You guys have the most interesting careers out there. Um, and, and yes, I say that was somewhat of a smile on my face, but, but it's, but you're amazing. You, you speak for justice. You, you, you represent folks and you help folks that, uh, that don't have agency or voice. And, and it's so critical what you do. And it's certainly the work of the lawyers committee, uh, is critical. And that's why it's so important for all of us to figure out new and different ways to support them. So let me throw it now, um, over to Roland and Kristen, take it away. I'll see you guys a little later in the program. But uh, have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. God bless. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Clark. I'm the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And we are kicking off our 20th annual A. Leon Hagenbotham Gala. We've got an exciting program in store. And I want to thank Hill Harper, our amazing and tireless national spokesperson for all that he does and for always standing by us. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Roland Martin, who's helping to host this evening. All right, glad to be here. I hate the fact that uh, we have to do uh, virtual, Christian, but the reality is with COVID-19, uh, we can't do these uh, group settings. Uh, it's always uh, a great dinner. Uh, folks uh, all dressed up, black tie uh, in New York. Because y'all switch between New York City and Washington, D.C., right? Mostly in New York. Gotcha. And so, uh, but uh, luckily with virtual, uh, we're still able to reach folks uh, all across the country. Uh, and so folks are watching the Lawyers Committee website, Facebook page, also on our three platforms of Roland Martin Unfiltered. So we're certainly glad uh, to be, uh, to have all of you here uh, to also help y'all do this here. The Lawyers Committee does great work. It has been absolutely crazy busy year. We'll talk about uh, uh, some of that uh, in just a second. Uh, but uh, you've got some honorees, some great folks that y'all have uh, recognized uh, this year. We do. Uh, it, this is an all-star program because they're just such amazing people doing tremendous work um, across our country right now. And I want to start off with our very, uh, I want to start off with our very first honoree, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms of Atlanta, Georgia. And it's my pleasure and honor to recognize uh, Mayor Lance Bottoms with our first award this afternoon. When the city of Atlanta and, frankly, our nation needed an, an example of courage, temperance, and steely resolve, the mayor stepped forward and spoke truth to power and calmed a reeling city and put forth an agenda to promote systemic change in policing. She has been a voice of reason that helped to save countless lives in the midst of one of the deadliest pandemics in history. You continue to shine a light on voter suppression, inequity in housing, and you champion the rights of the LGBTQ community. Mayor, we are delighted to recognize your tremendous leadership with the Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award. And of course, it was also great to see her speaking at uh, Congressman John Lewis's, uh, the ceremony there where she uh, uh, had some very clear words to uh, Governor Kemp who was sitting right there as well. And so that's what happens when you're a courageous mayor, uh, following in the lines of Maynard Jackson, Andrew Young, uh, Shirley Franklin, and so many others. Mayor Bottoms, take it away. 
Well, thank you so much, Kristen and Roland. Thank you to both of you. I am truly honored to receive this award. And uh, to Teresa Wynn Roseboro, uh, who's previously chaired this distinguished group, I was thinking about the opportunity that I had to attend this extravagant dinner in New York. And I was there with the Home Depot and my husband. And I was running for mayor at that time. And I remember being on the bus between the hotel and the venue and being so excited because I received a mock-up for my campaign bus. And the beauty of, of uh, having to do things virtually, you get to access props. And I saw this on my bookshelf today, and it was this bus. It was a mock-up uh, for my run for mayor. And I share that with you because I couldn't help but reflect on how far I've come personally uh, since I attended that dinner. And I believe that night Congressman Lewis was being honored. And Teresa recently shared a picture with me from that evening. But I reflected on how far I've come personally and certainly how far we have all come as a country and as really across the globe. And what I knew then when I ran for mayor um, was that I wanted to do something better for my city. I wanted something more for my city. And what I learned is running for mayor of Atlanta, the more exhausted I became, the more authentic I became in showing myself to the people of Atlanta. And that really um, has been what I've taken with me into office. Uh, my story is the story of so many people across this country, a story of one where I am direct descendant of a direct descent or descendant of slaves um, from my mother's family and from my father's family. And those direct descendants found their way to Atlanta looking for a better life for their children. On the other side of that story is my father's incarceration that led me into prisons across Georgia, seeing people who look just like me. Um, and then leading up into this summer, uh, who knew that in 2020 we would be faced with so much uncertainty, uh, including COVID-19 and what we face with social unrest across the country. But as Roland said, um, when you bring your authentic self to the table, like Congressman Lewis and so many others, we truly are able to impact our communities and make meaningful changes and speak truth to power. So. I am honored to receive this award, and I know that this is only the beginning, not the end of the work that's needed uh, to continue to address the systemic issues that continue to face people across our country. And I am, uh, I, I am honored for this award to receive it today, but I know the expectation is that the work will continue. So thank you all. Leadership, leadership for your work and your tireless efforts and it was an honor to have you kick off this evening with us thanks for all that you do and Christian of course when uh, when uh, they had the debate in Atlanta uh, the mayor was the first one to hold uh, a watch party in Tyler Perry's White House uh, <laughs> his uh, mock White House there uh, and uh, so uh, that, that that was pretty cool uh, th th those are the perks where you the mayor uh, where you can make that call and say look at here um, we want to have something in, in, uh, in your White House. So that was pretty cool uh, to hang out there, Mayor Bottoms. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. There I said go. it's wonderful to have great friends like Tyler and great friends like you, Roland. The part Roland didn't add was that he shut the party down without uh, <laughs> with me, and um, I ended up having to give him a ride home that night. Yes, indeed. So I certainly appreciate that. I appreciate that. Mayor Keisha Les Bottoms, you take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Kristen. Um, we are now going to hear from the Higginbotham family. This uh, marks our 20th annual A. Leon Higginbotham Gala, which is named after the esteemed late Judge A. Leon Higginbotham. And I'm pleased that we have one of the Higginbotham family members with us uh, today to present remarks. Michael Higginbotham. Hi, everybody. Michael Higginbotham here. It's my distinct pleasure to represent the Higginbotham family at this very special 20th anniversary celebration of the A. Leon Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Event. We in the Higginbotham family are so proud that the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights 
under law, continues to uplift the legacy of my uncle, Judge A. Leon Higginbotham Jr., with this inspiring and empowering event. Members of the family have attended annually since its inception in 2000. We are thrilled that this storied organization uh, continues to fight for issues that are so near and dear to our hearts. Protecting against voter suppression, housing inequality, helping to create equal opportunity and education for all. But we're also heartened by the Lawyers Committee's expansion into other areas, such as protecting against hate crimes, such as criminal justice reform and police reform, protecting peaceful protesters, uh, and uplifting communities that have been hit so hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. As we reflect on the 20th anniversary of this award, I wonder what my uncle would think about the various crises facing the country today. Would he be disappointed that we as a nation continue to grapple with issues of racial inequality? I am convinced that uh, he would be, but I'm equally convinced that he would use this opportunity to strengthen his resolve to fight for racial justice for all. I am delighted that the Lawyers Committee continues to embrace his legacy of fighting for equal justice for all. And I would encourage all of you to support the Lawyers Committee's efforts by joining in the fight starting tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. It is a pleasure and an honor to lift up the legacy of Judge Hagenbotham in the way that we do each and every year. So thank you so much for being with us. We're now going to move to our corporate honoree and to help introduce um, David Abney, who's receiving tonight's Hagenbotham Award. We're going to first hear from our event co-chair, Sally Yates. Sally Yates is a former Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and I'm proud to share she was also one of our Beacon of Justice honorees when we got to celebrate in person two years ago in New York. She's currently a partner at King & Spaulding in the Special Matters and Government Investigations Group. I am so proud and thrilled that Sally is able to be a part of this celebration. Sally? Well, thanks so much for, for that incredibly kind introduction. I am so honored to be able to join you all for this special 20th anniversary Higginbotham Award event. You know, on this occasion, I get to salute someone whom I deeply admired, Judge A. Leon Higginbotham Jr., a statesman and a civil rights icon, and to pay tribute to David Abney, UPS's outstanding executive chairman, and a humble humanitarian. I also get to continue to partner with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law, one of our nation's leading civil rights organizations that my firm is proud to have worked with to advance racial justice for more than two decades. And as a former Beacon of Justice honoree, I also get to share the stage this afternoon with this year's honoree, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Robert Smith, and many others. So it really doesn't get much better than this, unless, of course, we were all able to be here together in person. It's my privilege to serve as co-chair alongside Ernest Greer in this tribute to David Abney. As our nation undertakes a racial reckoning, racial reckoning we have come to understand more clearly that change doesn't just happen. It happens when people call for it and demand it. We've also learned that effective change has to be enduring and lasting. Those who lead major corporations play a very unique role in pushing forward that change, change that brings 
diverse perspective and experiences that enhance our society at large. As David so eloquently noted in his statements on diversity, equality, and inclusion several years ago, and I'm going to quote him here, we cannot in good conscience stand idly on the sidelines. We cannot reap the benefits of a diverse workforce without doing everything in our power to ensure that all people have the opportunity to reach their potential. As you'll see, this is the culture that David has cultivated at UPS ever since, ever since he took the helm of the company. And frankly, this is the perspective that we need from CEOs at every Fortune 500 company, the, the, the attitude that we need to embrace that if we're going to end the disparities that hinder communities of color and, and rob us of the vital contributions that diverse communities can make to advance our nation. As companies are redoubling their efforts to ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion are real and meaningful principles, UPS is leading the way. UPS is leading the way through in ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in real and meaningful ways. The company is urging Congress to adopt the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, funding and partnering with organizations like the Lawyers Committee that advance the core values of UPS of fairness, dignity, and respect for all. UPS has also pledged over 1 million UPS employee volunteer hours of service around the world in support of mentorship and educational programming in underserved Black communities. Throughout his career, David Abney has not stood on the sidelines, but instead has stepped up to implement programs that accelerate change that reflect the diversity of our nation. Please join me now in welcoming Ernest Greer as he presents the 2020 A. Leon Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Award to David Abney. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ernest Greer, and I'm honored to serve as co-chair for this special event, paying tribute to my friend David Abney and recognizing his commitment to diversity and inclusion. As we join together today, we all recognize that we are in unprecedented times. At this juncture, America is finally speaking truthfully about the systematic racism that continues to plague our nation. And during this time, it is more important than ever to celebrate diversity, to celebrate inclusion, and to celebrate those who are taking action to make change. This year's honoree, David Abney, is a true example of a soldier taking action to fight this war. I've been fortunate to witness David's dedication and commitment to social and community activism firsthand. I've had the pleasure of knowing David and Sherry, his wife, for a number of years. Indeed, David and I currently serve on the executive committee of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, and we share the outlook that as community leaders and as business leaders, it is our responsibility to create an environment where minorities feel included at all levels of an organization. And just as important, that minorities feel comfortable voicing their concerns. David has used his role at UPS and his voice in the Atlanta community, not simply to create awareness, but to drive action that has led to the creation of numerous UPS programs that focus on diversity and inclusion. David continues to step up to advocate for change in a very public way and to take a stand against injustice and discrimination. Thanks to David's efforts, Diversity and inclusion are not just buzzwords at UPS. They are core to UPS's business strategy and crucial to the continued success of the company. We all need to follow David's lead and to continue to move diversity and inclusion from vision to action. We need to reach inside ourselves and outside ourselves and ask the hard questions and be understanding and open-minded about the answers. Real, sustainable change 
takes action from all of us. And with that, it is my honor to present the 2020 A. Leon Higginbotham Award to David Abney. Thank you. In 1956, a UPS HR manager heard Whitney Young, who was head of the National Urban League, give a speech about the failure of U.S. companies to tap into the African-American employment base. He responded by finding and hiring Ken Jarvis, UPS's first African-American driver. Ken stayed for 37 years and ended up as vice president of HR. We now have over 22,000 black drivers. When Patrice Clark Washington was in high school, she wanted to be a flight attendant because she thought it was the only way she could fly. But in 1988, she joined UPS as a flight engineer. Six years later, we promoted her to captain, our first African-American female pilot and the first to command a plane for a major U.S. airline. We now have 141 black and 175 female crew members. When you've been in business for 113 years, you get to create a lot of firsts. At UPS, many of those firsts have to do with diversity. That's because UPS holds diversity and inclusion as a core value, both inside and outside our walls. That matters a great deal to UPS and UPSers. It matters a great deal to me. You see, I grew up in the segregated South in the Mississippi Delta. The Civil Rights Movement was going on all around me, and so was the belief in a separate but equal society. It was definitely separate, but there was nothing equal about it. It wasn't until I came to UPS as a package handler at 18 that I realized it was completely wrong. I like to say that I earned my bachelor's degree from Delta State, but I got an honorary master's in diversity and inclusion from UPS. I've had the opportunity to be part of a great company and that opportunity changed my life. I am forever grateful. But more than that, equally important, I want others to have the opportunity I had in businesses and organizations throughout our country and the world. But will they? Will black and brown students growing up in the Mississippi Delta or in America's inner cities have these same opportunities? Will people who don't look like me and don't have the same advantages have the same opportunities as me? As we struggle to emerge from a pandemic that has put lives and businesses on hold, now seems the ideal time to examine the state of inequality and opportunity in our country. We now have a chance to hit the reset button on our lives businesses and communities, and reconsider the way we treat, support, and nourish those for whom opportunity now seems a distant concept. As a global company with almost half a million employees living and working in more than 220 countries and territories, what UPS does matters. At UPS, we have a unique opportunity and genuine commitment to inspire, motivate, and elevate people's lives. We do that by embracing the diversity we represent. Hundreds of thousands of employees, customers, and suppliers that represent and touch all parts of the world. We do that by cultivating the inclusion necessary for those voices to be heard and listened to. We do that by advancing equity to ensure everyone has the opportunity to go further and reach higher. I'm proud to represent a company that upholds diversity and inclusion as a core value. I'm blessed to work alongside phenomenal people of all backgrounds who have made and continue to make UPS 
one of the most amazing companies in the world. I'm excited to see how Carol Tomei, our new CEO, will continue and expand our efforts to make sure that all UPSers are allowed to fully live up to their potential. And I am honored, truly honored, to accept this award on behalf of UPS. Thank you. All right. Big, great job, UPS. Uh, they spent a lot of time delivering stuff to my house. So, yes. uh, so certainly <laughs> glad to see uh, you honoring them. Yeah, and look, UPS does a great job in terms of really showcasing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's what we look for each year, a corporation that we can lift up for doing the right thing to help push other corporations to follow their lead. So thrilled to get the chance to honor David Abney today. All right, folks, though you are watching, please use the hashtag, hashtag Justice2020. Uh, if you're making any comments on Instagram, Twitter, uh, on Facebook, or any other platforms, we certainly would love to go back and see those comments. Now, we I got another honoree coming up next. And normally, you know, we have these things, the enormous presentation, even at the dinner. But since we're virtual and it's a broadcast, we chose to do something a little bit different. Uh, and so, uh, Soledad O'Brien, uh, uh, award-winning journalist, uh, two-time uh, National Association of Black Journalists, Journalist of the Year, uh, friend of mine. She's worked at she, she worked everywhere. She's been at NBC, <laughs> CNN. She's worked local television. She's got her own company, HBO. She's worked all over the place. Now having her own company, Starfish Media, which is great. Uh, and so, uh, we wanted to uh, have something interesting and different for y'all uh, for our next honoree, uh, and that. That is? Uh, we're going to have an exchange between the great Soledad O'Brien, who we honored last year uh, with our Beacon of Justice Award at the Higginbotham Gala, in dialogue and discussion with Nicole Hannah Jones. And I am so thrilled and proud to get the opportunity to recognize her for her voice and her leadership. And I'll say, we recognized her before she got the Pulitzer. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's my pleasure to, to recognize the amazing Nicole Hannah Jones. And you know, what can I say about Nicole? She is fiercely dedicated and unapologetic about her pursuit of a true narrative on American history. Following in the footsteps of her heroes, uh, Ida B. Wells, Ethel Payne, uh, Claude Sitton. Uh, Nicole has helped to lead the racial justice reckoning that is occurring right now at this moment in our country. Her Pulitzer Prize winning the 1619 Project has brought front and center many parts of our history that many would rather be left untold. She has set the table for a frank discussion on the racial reckoning that we must undertake if we're gonna tear down systemic racism in our nation. Nicole continues to lift up the disparities and inequities that children of color face in seeking a quality education, and she continues to champion the cause of the disenfranchised. It is my pleasure to recognize Nicole's deep-seated and unrelenting commitment to advancing racial justice with our Beacon of Justice Award. Welcome, Nicole. So it. I'll take it away. Nicole, let me be the second person to congratulate you. How exciting. And have you noticed that everybody's glomming on to you now that you have the Pulitzer? I knew Nicole <laughs> before she got that Pulitzer. Congratulations to you. We're so excited. Um, I want to talk to you about this racial reckoning, which is the centerpiece of the 1619 Project. And maybe we start in education, which I think is a big piece of this. And you and I have discussed this many times before. Today, the news in New York City, of course, was that schools won't start till, till uh, I think, mid or late October now. You have a child in the New York City public school system. Talk to me about the implications of this news, not just for New York City kids, but as everybody across the country struggles with what to do about schooling. Yes, thank you, Soledad, and uh, thank you to the Lawyers Committee for this amazing honor. Uh, you guys are such an important organization in furthering and advancing uh, civil and human rights for all Americans, but particularly for the work in advancing those rights for black Americans. So I, I'm really honored to receive this award today and to be in conversation with Soledad, who is the person who uh, 
allowed my daughter to go horseback riding for the first time in her <laughs> life. So uh, she she still talks about that. So thank you. Um, you know, we we are in uh, and and it's not hyperbolic at all to say we are in an unparalleled and unprecedented moment right now. And uh, I am deeply afraid of what this pandemic uh, and and what it has done to public education is going to do, particularly for Black students who all the research shows stand to lose the most in achievement gains uh, during these sh uh, shutdowns, even as they were already uh, having the largest uh, academic achievement gap or opportunity gap. So, you know, we all learned today in New York City, school had already been delayed. Uh, New York City is attempting to become, of course, the biggest district in America to reopen the schools. And um, I think whatever trust that parents have had in the district right now is being severely damaged as we uh, thought we were going to be sending our kids back to school on Monday and have learned that we will not. Um, there are children who have not logged in to uh, get their virtual education since the school shut down in March. Uh, we have, of course, uh, tens of thousands of homeless children in the city, children who need to be in school and uh, have no idea when they're going to be able to return and get the instruction instruction that they need. So all of the inequalities that already existed are being exacerbated uh, in ways that uh, we won't even know the long-term implications. And with very little, um, it seems, planning on how we're going to address it. Yeah, and we'll talk about the trust in how people navigate that in just a moment. But we know that Black and Hispanic kids are, are more heavily impacted by COVID-19, higher case rates, higher hospitalizations, more virus-related complications. Um, on the other hand, parents need their kids to go back to school. And I'm, I don't have children the same age as your daughter, who was fun to take horseback riding. She was a <laughs> true joy. Um, but she's little, right? And, and how do you as a parent, and how should parents who are worried about their children's education be be juggling those two concerns. They've got to go back. They've got to learn. And also, here's a long list of challenges specifically around coronavirus and COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, we cannot pretend that there are easy solutions. This is uh, an unparalleled moment. And how do you provide education um, in New York to a school district of one million, mostly low-income kids, uh, in the time of COVID with um, the majority of the kids in the district being Black and Latino, who, of course, are also the, the children who are most likely to be exposed and to suffer from the pandemic. It is not easy right now. Um, in New York, you had the option of whether you would do uh, online only or if you would opt in to uh, spend half of the week online and half of the week uh, in person. And yet, we aren't seeing any of that going well right now. Um, and so I think parents are really struggling. We, we know that particularly low-income black and brown parents, they can't hire outside help to come in while they're trying to work. Uh, they rely very heavily on schools. Um, they may not have access to Wi-Fi so that their kids can actually uh, access online education. Uh, and here we are in one of you know, the richest city in the world. We have more billionaires per capita in New York, or actually in real numbers, than anywhere else in the world. And yet we are struggling to provide basic education for the public school children of the city. It, it, it's immoral, and we should uh, be able to do much better than what we're doing. Inequity has long been uh, a focus of your work. Uh, you've been getting the 1619 Project, which was, I don't even know if I have enough superlatives to talk about it. Brilliant, genius, amazing, interesting, <laughs> compelling, thought-provoking. Um, you've been working to get that into school districts and school systems. How, uh, obviously, schools are in chaos. But outside of that, how, how's that going? What, what do you think in the long term will be the future of the 1619 Project and getting it in the hands of school children? So the 1619 curriculum, which is available for free to any educators who want to teach it, if they go to the Pulitzer Center website, has been um, downloaded in over 5,000 schools uh, in the country, in every state in the country. Uh, several school districts have already made it mandatory curriculum, including Chicago, uh, Newark, Newark uh, Washington, D.C., Buffalo. So it is uh, spreading all into classrooms all across the country. And teachers are using it for social studies, for English, uh, for music. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it is becoming so popular that 
as we speak, you know, President Trump was holding a press conference uh, talking about ways that he can inhibit schools from teaching the project. And a, a bill has now been introduced into both the House and the Senate uh, attempting to cut off federal funds to school districts that teach the 1619 Project. So what we're exposing is a true fear of our children learning a more accurate depiction of the United States and one that does not deify our founders or our founding, but actually teaches us uh, that we have a lot of work to do to make those majestic ideals true. Uh, you and I are Twitter friends, and sometimes yes. we jump into Twitter battles. The other one is having to, <laughs> to help out a little bit. But in all seriousness, it's been interesting to me around the 1619 Project, how much flack and uh, uh, how many people attack you. I mean, as if somehow the idea that America was founded uh, on themes around oppression and injustice is like a new idea. It's a little, the shock is shocking to me, if you will. Um, how has that how has that been? I have to imagine difficult, but in all seriousness, how is it navigating um, this environment that is very divided? And I think when it comes to racial conversations, uh, very racist and very uh, fraught, frankly, um, with sometimes danger, especially for women and women of color. Yes, I know you know, uh, Soledad, that uh, black women in particular face a tremendous amount of vitriol online. Um, the types of emails and voicemails I get, I, I've been called uh, names that I can't mention on here. Uh, I've been threatened. People have threatened to come burn down my house. Um, so it's, you know, this work is serious and this work also really leads people to want to attack you. And it, it doesn't help when you have uh, the most powerful man in America uh, constantly evoking your project as dangerous, as something that needs to be censored. He called it toxic propaganda today. Uh, and that really liberates people to attack not just my work, but me as a person. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I just tweeted about Ida B. Wells. I stand on the shoulders of a long history of Black Americans, and particularly Black women, who refused to be silenced, um, who knew that the work that they were doing was important for our democracy, was important for our communities. And so the work only continues. And, and the more they talk about it, the more power they, they give to the work. And one thing that I was... Uh, that I was thinking about the other day is every time uh, Trump or conservatives bring up 1619, they're actually spreading the word to their followers. So now even Trump's followers, they know the year 1619, and they know that 1619 marks the beginning of American slavery. So uh, he's actually giving this project that published a year ago, um, expanding its reach and expanding the knowledge of that date. Sub question on this. Where do people get a copy of that remarkable <laughs> magazine? It was phenomenal, but then my girlfriends came and stole many of my copies. I still have my original copy. Uh, but for people who are interested or, or really didn't get a chance to get a, a copy, where would you tell them they could find it? Well, uh, these days on eBay or Amazon on the <laughs> secondary market, you can't get it. We, we've sold out of the, uh, we've released uh, several additional print runs and sold out. However, we are putting together a 1619 Project book. It will be released next fall, uh, and it will include everything that was in the original book, as well as eight additional essays by some of your favorite scholars and writers. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Back to school for a moment. Do you think, and I, I, I hate to ever talk about, is there a silver lining in anything? But I always wonder, um, my son, who's severely hearing impaired, has found recording classes very helpful. Like if there's something good that has come out of this completely messed up educational situation is now that teachers record their classes, because he misses a lot of what's said, he goes back and listens to it. And I wonder if that's going to stay once we come through the other side of this pandemic. Will there be things that you say, that actually is worth keeping. And this thing over here is worth keeping because it is a benefit to students. Is there anything that you've seen that you would put in the category of worthwhile benefit we should explore more? I mean, there are certainly things that could be good coming out of this. Uh, but even your son having his lectures recorded in many school districts, um, 
those lectures are not being recorded. And in fact, teachers have fought against having their lectures recorded or live streamed. So you would have to find a way to kind of universalize some of those things that work. But certainly, there's some kids who would rather do their own course of study. Um, there's some kids who have actually found uh, being able to go from school to school from home to be very beneficial to them. Um, there's certain innovations in terms of uh, teaching techniques and classroom management that I think we could transfer. But I would actually argue that overall, what we have found is that um, you can't really replicate the classroom experience. You can't really replicate uh, that, that personal interaction and that learning, that academic learning and that social learning that happens when kids and teachers are in a classroom together. Uh, I, I hope that the one good thing that has come out of this is that we all have a greater appreciation for what educators actually do. As so many of us parents have had to become homeschoolers against our will, uh, the <laughs> idea that anyone can teach, that this is somehow uh, easy, I think uh, we've all been disabused of that notion. I, I just want my child in a classroom with a professional <laughs> teacher. <laughs> I think it was Shonda Rhimes, I think, who was like, my child's teacher needs to be paid a million dollars about <laughs> yeah. two hours into homeschooling. Um, you, you wrote about your daughter's class in the New York Times, and you were talking about, uh, she has a class of 33 students, you said, um, and only about 10 logged in. So what, what happens to the other 23? Is there a strategy to find them, reach out to them? I, I, of course, to me, you worry when you hear numbers like that, because you think, well, not only do they not go to class, but then they're, they, they're not going to finish the year. And if they're not finishing the year, will they ever get to their senior year? And if they don't get to their senior year, what happens to them as human beings? This is what I worry about. Yeah, it's, it's what I worry about too. And um, I think that school districts, teachers have made, you know, valiant efforts to try to track down kids, but um, there's still so many kids who are just missing. They are off the grid. We don't know where they are. We don't know um, what kind of instruction they, they may or may not be getting. Um, and I am deeply concerned uh, that those kids are simply never going to catch up that, um, of course, the kids who are not signing in are also already the kids who were the most vulnerable in the first place. Um, and we have, you know, there's nothing about what is happening in many districts that inspires us to think that they are going to get this together, that they are somehow going to be able to catch those kids up. We're talking about kids that uh, many of them were already being failed prior to the pandemic. Um, we're also gonna be uh, expecting massive budget cuts to educa uh, education and to school districts because of the plummeting tax base. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I don't think that there is a silver lining right now. And uh, I'm trying to um, really toll the alarm that we have got to, um, as elected officials and as everyday citizens uh, push our officials to address what is going to be a major catastrophe for education. Yeah, it, it's terrifying. I agree. And I guess ultimately, and this will be my last question before we uh, kick it back to a video, um, a tremendous injustice, right, if we're thinking about justice and fighting for fairness, is the educational disparities. It's just unfair. It's unfair how the difference in money, it's unfair the difference in opportunity, it's unfair the difference in outcome. It's just wildly, blatantly, overtly, obviously unfair. How do we fix it? I, I don't know that there's a political will, and I don't even know that people, regular people, understand it or care. I mean, I think that is a, a big problem with the way we have come to think and talk about public education, which I have uh, spent a lot of my work talk, um, writing about, which is we used to think about this as a common good. Now we think about it as uh, an individual good and a consumer market, and that is an opposition. So now, instead of us uh, saying, you know, we need well-funded schools and we need to ensure that all of our schools are adequate, now we want to be able to shop and we want to be able to say, well, as long as my child is getting a good education, I can't be concerned about other kids. Um, schools are public schools in particular, are one of the few places left in society where people mix, mix across racial and class lines. They are the democratizing force of our nation. And if we don't invest in them, and, and we're not, we can look at the presidential campaign and, and ask ourselves, how many times have we heard public education even brought up in the presidential campaign? We say 
nothing is more important than education. That's what we tell our children all the time. And then we don't talk about it. We don't push to fund it. And we allow these really uh, egregious inequities. And then we blame the children for somehow not being able to overcome them. Uh, that's why I, I'm so grateful for the work that the Lawyers Committee does, because it is every day uh, pushing against that inequality and trying to fight so that our children all have access to the education that we deserve. Nicole Hannah-Jones, congratulations to you and thank you for this conversation. Appreciate it. Roland, I'm going to send it back to you. So, Dad, appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Congratulations to Nicole for her award. Uh, Kristen, um... Uh, big pick, good honoree. Yeah, oh, uh, thrilled to honor Nicole. She just speaks truth to power and has is literally sparked a conversation that is long overdue about racism and slavery in our country. Right now, I'm listening to her 1619 podcast, which is um, pretty incredible, and I encourage folks to to listen in. I want to know where she got that vote button. Uh, but we'll find out about that after the program. Well, you know, uh, when, when you do good work, you make people mad. So uh, I, I, that's what I love, all the people who are just so upset. Uh, and I was, uh, and Nicole's still there? I, was, I, saw one of her I saw one of her tweets where she was talking about this, this so-called conference or whatever on American history Trump had today and not a single black historian mm. on there. So that's no shock. Mm. That's no shock. Uh, the, 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 la the last year has been real... Uh, busy for y'all, the Lawrence Committee. It has been. <laughs> Between the pandemic and this crisis that we now face as we are really trying to confront racial violence and hatred and white supremacy and police violence, um, it's really upended our work and created new challenges. We are firing on all cylinders. The, the work that probably is keeping us up... Um, the, you know, really late at night is not only the work to fight voter suppression, but really figuring out how we as civil rights lawyers can do something about police violence. Um, we know that this is not a new issue. We know that the only thing that is new is that the images are going viral and that for the first time it has become uncomfortable for people to look away from the violence perpetrated against innocent black lives. Um, so we've been, uh, you know, working on dealing with police unions and the grip that right. they have, the stranglehold that they have on police departments and thinking about how we can overcome um, some of the restrictions that those police union contracts put in uh, place. I mean, we know the solution, right? We need to end racial profiling. We need to end ch uh, choke holds and neck holds. We need to... Uh, make it easier to track police officers so they can't bounce from one police department to another. Um, we need better training. We need more diversity inside police departments. We need more um, police officers who don't bring that warrior mentality right. to the work. But police unions are a real issue and have become a real focus for our criminal justice project. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but, I, but I think a lot of people really don't, as far as I'm concerned, really don't understand um, when you talk about uh, civil rights legal work, okay? Uh, sure, folks hear about what's happened with police. Sure, they hear about voting. But when you look, when and talk about some of, this, you know, the breadth of the type of lawsuits uh, that y'all have filed, whether it's dealing with prisons, whether it's dealing with individuals, hair discrimination. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, so it, it, it goes far beyond just, you know, sort of, you know, uh, the, the, you know, voting issues in police. Right. I mean, in the, we've got this problem of mass incarceration of black people in this country. And so what we've tried to do is attack the drivers of that. One of the biggest drivers uh, is this problem of debtors' prisons. Mm -hmm. You know, f jurisdictions that impose fines and fees on poor people who are disproportionately black and brown, who end up getting entangled in the criminal justice system merely because of their poverty and their inability to pay. And we've seen the resurgence of these debtors' prisons across the country. And so that's a, been a big issue that we've been tackling, especially in the South, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. Another issue is what happens when people get charged and they don't have a lawyer by their side. So we have been fighting the state of Louisiana that has one of the most broken mm -hmm. public defender systems in the country. Louisiana's legislature will not pony up the money needed to make sure that they provide lawyers to poor people as required by the Constitution 
Instead, what they do is um, they finance the system off of fees and fines extracted from defendants. So in a weird way, it creates this perverse incentive for lawyers to fail their clients because that's the only way you pump money into, their, into the system. And wow. so fighting for right to counsel for black people who face um, criminal charges has also been a really big focus. And that's also, uh, you know, one of the states we, we saw. We saw the story uh, of the black man who was given life in prison for trying to steal some um, shears, uh, some yeah, la lawn Louisiana. shears. And right. and uh, for them, you know, you know, when you look at the people, eighty percent of the folks who are in prison. Uh, who are under that particular provision, uh, that three strikes or habitual offender yeah. uh, law, 80% of them are black. Yeah, pig laws. Uh, they're uh, de the descendant of these things called pig laws. And it's just a reminder that racism infects virtually every stage of our criminal justice system. I mean, that man faces life in prison for an attempted theft. It's outrageous, but it's a problem that we know is pervasive across our country. And so the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, fighting for a fairer criminal justice system is one of our biggest priorities. So for the folks who don't, so first of all, so for the people who have no idea, what exactly is the Lawyers Committee? How many people are we talking about? How many, how, I mean, you know, uh, how many people uh, are you supervising uh, and, and, uh, and are y'all filing suits all across the country? Do you have, you, so just explain to people exactly what the Lawyers Committee is. So the Lawyers Committee came about in 1963. Um, Medgar Evers assassinated at his home in Mississippi. Many people will, will uh, recall Medgar Evers was a NAACP activist working to register black Field voters. Field secretary of Mississippi. That's yep. right. So this is the heyday of the civil rights movement. And President John F. Kennedy um, at that time convened a meeting of lawyers at the White House. And his charge to them was that you all are not doing enough to engage in the civil rights fight. There were about 240 lawyers who came to that meeting. Those lawyers heard him. They went back to their home communities and they started to take on cases protecting the rights of people, marching for the right to vote, registering people to vote, protecting the rights of people engaged in sit-ins, protecting the rights of people who faced racial injustice. And so today, what makes us a unique organization is we are all about pushing lawyers, pushing the private bar to stand shoulder to shoulder with us as we do our work. So I've got a big board of 240 lawyers Dang. who commit. That's a um, big board. <laughs> it is, and a dedicated board that stands up with us to do this work. So whether you're talking about fighting voter suppression, we've filed two dozen cases since the pandemic, um, our criminal justice work, um, fighting to protect hate crime victims, fighting for economic justice, um, fighting fair housing, pushing back against the Trump administration. In all of this work, we're doing this work drawing on the pro bono support of lawyers across the country. So I, I've got a team, an amazing team of about 80 people, but the breadth and scope of our docket looks more like a 200-person organization mm -hmm. because of that uh, pro bono support that we draw on from the private bar. Uh, obviously, uh, resources matter. And so uh, are you in a constant state of fundraising? And how can people watching, how can they support the Lawyers Committee? Yeah, uh, we do need support to fuel our fight and to prepare for the future. We know that on the other side of this, right, is going to be a lot of work to rebuild and reconstruct our country. My goal is to make sure that the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law maintains our presence as one of our leading, our country's leading racial justice organizations standing up for black people across the country. And so people can donate uh, to support our fight by texting LCCRUL to 202-858-1233 or by visiting our website and hitting that donate button. All of that support that we get goes to fuel the fight happening right now, happening today. All right, so what I want to do is, uh, all the folks who are watching, uh, our goal is uh, to, uh, and we'll be able to track this, uh, to see if we can, uh, let's see. I think we should set a target of $50,000 to raise for the Lawyers Committee. That way, and again, if you go to the website, if you text the number, go ahead and, uh, again, it's uh, text LCCRUL. 
LCC RUL 202-858-1233. Uh, and we talk about, again, uh, the cases we're talk talking about. It's again, I, I mentioned the hair discrimination case, the brother who That's was right. at the school in Texas That's right. uh, where they said his hair was too long. Right, or the wrestler. Right. right, had to cut his hair. So you saw so y'all involved in those cases. That's our economic justice group doing that important work. Yes, we're fighting all of the ways in which things are used as a pretext to hold black people back. That so the hair housing discrimination cases. I mean, so again, and again, that's why I think I think of a lot of time when people when they think about civil rights. In, in, in the law, that is in a very narrow uh, window, as in, it is much broader. Uh, and so, for the folks, again, every dollar, whether whether it, if you want to give ten thousand, a thousand, five thousand, a hundred dollars, twenty dollars, five dollars, a buck, every dollar does indeed matter. You were talking earlier about uh, police reform, and and this week we saw the uh, announcement of the settlement uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, in the Breonna Taylor case. And uh, uh, the headline everybody focused on was $12 million. Right. But what was, to me, what was far more important were all of those reforms, all of those police reforms that were a part of that settlement, which would not have come about right. without the work of your next honoree. Yes, that's right. So our next honoree is the amazing Ben Crump. Um, ben Crump is receiving this year's Trailblazer for Justice Award. Ben Crump is that attorney who is always there, standing right behind victims and families impacted by police violence. And he does this work tirelessly. I last saw Ben on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial uh, during the commemorative March on Washington convened by Reverend Al Sharpton and Reverend Martin Luther King III. He is always there, uh, a voice of courage, an attorney who just gives it all to fight and to stand up for the ways in which black people uh, face injustice in our criminal justice system. So we are thrilled to honor Ben uh, for his leadership and his work. Ben, congratulations. Not shocking for an Omega. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Roland, my alpha brother. Uh, and to Kirsten Clark and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, I am so very grateful uh, to get this award, especially bearing the name of Judge Higginbotham, who was not just a great jurist, not just a great civil rights leader, not just a great man, but he also was my fraternity brother, a great Omega man. So it bears special meaning for me uh, because he is a giant in the world of jurisprudence and civil rights. We stand on his shoulder today as we fight to challenge the legalized genocide of colored people in courtrooms all across America and to try to make this society a more just America where George Floyd gets to take a breath, where Breonna Taylor has an opportunity to sleep in peace, where Ahmaud Arbery has an opportunity to run free, and Joe West, where all of our children have a right to equal opportunities at the American dream and life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's what I try to do every day, and it is done in the legacy of Judge Leon Higginbotham and those great lawyers who have come through the decades of sacrifice on the front line as Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I am so honored and I accept this on behalf of all those families, Roland Martin, that I have come on your show to say that their lives matter, black lives matter. Ben, a lot of people, a lot of people um, don't see the actual work the civil rights lawyers do. The average person, what they think in terms of courtroom scene, uh, somebody found guilty or a, a, a jury making the decision, 
but a, but a lot of the work really doesn't end up in the courtroom. It's really the legal work that it's unseen in boardrooms, uh, in back rooms, negotiating deals like the one in the Breonna Taylor case. This was such a significant uh, settlement, not just because of the $12 million as we talked about, Roland, but Kirsten, that is very important because it recognizes that a black woman won't continue to be disrespected in death or marginalized in death like so many black women who have been killed by the police have been disrespected. But it's the reform. And Roland Martin, you know better than anybody how hard we have to work in the background just to make people in American society know the names of these uh, black people who have been senselessly and unjustifiably killed by police. And so when we were uh, with attorney Lanita Baker and attorney Sam Aguilar, my great co-counselors in Kentucky, we were talking to the mayor and city attorney, and they seemed shocked when we said Miss Tamika Palmer, Brianna's mother, more than any dollar amount, she's more concerned about reform because she's trying to build a legacy for her daughter, and that legacy would be to try to avoid any more Breonna Taylors. Yeah, we. Um, I want to thank you for reminding the public that black women and black girls are also victims of police violence, and we have to say their names. Sandra Bland, right? We have to say their names. This settlement is historic and remarkable. I think one question that I have for you, Ben, is what more do we need to do to really transform the Louisville Police Department? There's some important reforms that have been put in place, but what do you think we need to really overhaul that police department and make it a model of reform for the rest of the country? You know, Kirsten, and it's not just Louisville, this all these cities like Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, Lafayette, Louisiana, where Trafford Pellerin was killed. And, and I'm just talking about cases this year, Roland. I haven't even got to the Dallas mm -hmm. Police Department with Botham mm -hmm. Jones right, or right. Terrence Crunch in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But I believe we have to seize this moment, Kirsten, and God knows we're going to need the leadership of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights because we have an opportunity right now to change the culture and the behavior of policing in America. And if we don't seize this moment, then I predict we will have hashtags happening every month in every city of these unjustifiable killings of black people by police. And we'll have cities uh, where they're protesting riots because people are, are saying enough is enough. While everybody in America is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we in Black America are dealing with the 1619 pandemic, right. which is, as you all talked earlier, the year that we were first brought over as enslaved Africans. And Kirsten, you know better than most, for 401 years, we have been fighting systematic racism and oppression, where they are killing our people not only outside the courtroom, but they're killing our people every day in every city and every state inside the courtroom with these trumped up felony convictions. And I do mean trumped up felony convictions. So now more than ever, as Roland was saying, people need to donate to the Lawyers Committee. We need to have strong lawyers who have moral character fighting for what my grandmother called the least of these. So we got to change the coaching behavior of policing, change this moment into a movement, change all this pain into power. But most importantly, we have to change the protest into policy to have long lasting systemic reform in the name of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Dijon Kenzie, Trayford Pellerin. And I'm just talking about the people this year, bro. Right. Right. I ain't talking about, you know. Well, here's my question for being and for you and you and Christian, uh, and that is, uh, have you have the two of you experienced um, not a resurgence but an increase, if you will, of young folks 
who want to become civil rights lawyers. Uh, a after the 1960s, uh, there, were, there were a significant number of people who wanted to go into civil rights law. But then as we got into the late 70s and the 1980s, it became more about, hey, go into the corporate world uh, and, and, and make that dollar. And then, of course, when Johnny Cochran uh, took, uh, took a Geronimo Pratt case and so many others, people began to see that. And, and really, that, that, that si the civil rights lawyer became somebody that, that drifted in the background. And then, of course, we talk about Thurgood Marshall uh, and Concerts Banker Motley and so many others. So, uh, and y'all travels around the country. And talk, have you seen younger folks say, you know what? I want to commit myself to civil rights law. Christian? Yeah, we have. We have. And, you know, I think there are two things that we're seeing. One, lawyers at corporate law firms who are willing to give up that big paycheck to come and dedicate their time and work with us. We've actually um, have had a number of those lawyers join our team in recent months, being flooded by lawyers who are saying, how can I be deployed? But yes, more young people who want to stand up and want to fight. And you know, the fight inside the courtroom matters just as much as the fight in the streets. And so, you know, one of the things that I want to make sure we lift up and acknowledge is that this outcome with Breonna Taylor also goes to the credit of the courageous people who have been marching and protesting every day in the streets, right? Because they are making sure that we are shining a light on the injustice. They are making sure that every day we are saying their name. They're making sure that every day we are lighting up the Kentucky Attorney General Cameron um, for not taking action to hold those officers accountable. So I want to lift up the, the role of activists and of the Black Lives Matter movement and the people who are out protesting every day. And, you know, we were just, uh, we were just showing, uh, we were just showing uh, a video there uh, of um, uh, of uh, the folks with Until Freedom. They've been on the ground uh, in Louisville uh, protesting. In fact, uh, Henry, let's do this here. I want to uh, share just a quick little video uh, of Alicia Keys and others uh, who have been advocating. We showed you a graphic earlier. Oprah Winfrey has been very involved. And to Kristen's point, uh, Ben, um, a lot of these cases we've heard about men and the men involved. And so in this, the Breonna Taylor case, we've had previous cases, Ayanna Jones, uh, Rakia Boyd, Sandra Bland and others. But this case really has galvanized uh, a lot of women, especially black women, uh, to make sure that the attention also is placed on it. So th this is a, one of the videos presented by the folks with Until Freedom. I'm going to come back to you, Ben Crump. What happened to Breonna Taylor? I am Tamika Palmer. I am the mother of Brianna Taylor. Three officers on the Louisville Metro Police Department used a battering ram to knock down her door. They fired 22 times. Eight of those bullets landed in the body of the most essential worker I will ever know. Bree was murdered by the Louisville Metro Police Department. And after they killed her, they asked me if she had any enemies. No, absolutely not. This story started coming out differently and people started learning the truth of what was happening and the things that went wrong that night. Now the whole city is mad. Now the whole world is mad. Final comment to Ben Crump. Roland Martin, uh, Lawyers Committee of Civil Rights, Kirsten Clark, thank you all so much for giving this award to me to highlight the Breonna Taylors of the world, the unknown Breonna Taylors of the world, like Pamela Turner in Baytown, Texas, and so many others who nobody ever say their name because of the efforts of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. It helps raise those names to give significance to their life because black lives matter. And we can never say that enough, whether in the streets or in the highest courts in the land. And that is our obligation to our people, to our ancestors, to those slaves who prayed in the field, Roland Martin, for us to have this legal education, this talent, these degrees, to go out and uplift our people. 
and uplift our culture. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Ben, for being with us. Looking forward to fighting alongside you as we work to end this crisis of police violence gripping our country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, folks, in order to change, of course, the world, you have to obviously have civil rights lawyers, you've got to have activists, but you've got to have policymakers as well. And the next honoree is certainly one of our top policymakers. Well, this is kind of a, a perfect transition. Uh, we've spent some time today really honoring amazing black women leaders. And Congresswoman Karen Bass is just that, an amazing black woman leader um, who's just been a champion for racial justice and social justice during her time in Congress. Um, we are honoring Congresswoman Bass today in particular for her leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus and the way in which she has shepherded the voice of the Black Caucus during these dark and turbulent times has been critical. But we are also honoring her for her lifetime of advocacy on criminal justice issues, on issues impacting vulnerable people in our foster care system, and most especially for championing the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. She did not sit back as communities were crying out for reform in the wake of the tragic killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. So it is my privilege and honor to recognize Congresswoman Bass tonight. Actually, Congresswoman, I think you are on mute. So if you can unmute uh, your uh, microphone oh, there. There you go. There we go. Now we got you. Go ahead. First of all, let me just thank you for this honor. I am um, very, very moved that you would consider honoring me. Let me compliment you on a wonderful program. I've been watching this program. It's been really, really good. And the work that you do, I mean, what was great about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was the partnership that we had together the way that all of the people on the streets, hundreds of thousands of people, every state in the United States, countries around the world, and Roland, you will especially appreciate this, all 54 countries on the continent of Africa joined in and went to the United Nations and registered their protests about what was going on in the United States. And so it took that movement, it took the activism of the Lawyers Committee, it took all of the work that people had been doing for so many years that created the groundswell that allowed the legislation to happen. Kristen, I know you've been working on this issue for years, and we've tried to get many of the pieces of legislation that made up the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed. I am convinced that we're going to do it. It might take a little time, but it won't be years. I'm actually looking at the clock, 46 days, 46 days. We need to right this ship. We need to do everything we can to make sure we do that so that we can actually address these issues. It's been sad that we have an administration that actually has done everything they can to fan the flames of racial tension. But this movement is not going to stop. And so I have the award here, and I'm just extremely honored to accept this award today. Congresswoman Bass, there are so many people, again, who don't understand. We always talk about connecting the dots. Policymakers matter. You on the federal level, we just had Ben Crump talking about that settlement with the city yes. of Louisville to change this issue of policing. People have to, you got to literally go school districts, city councils, county commissioners, state legislatures, and Congress. It can't just be like, here's one law, uh, or like the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, passes one law, boom, everything is solved. But you know what was great about all the folks in the street? I mean, while we were working hard on the legislation, what was happening around the country, I think, has really led to a seismic shift because we saw states move, we saw cities move. In my city, they raised the whole question of policing in schools because in Los Angeles, we have our own police department just for the school district. People started looking at that. For the first time that I recall, people linked it up to systemic racism. I tell everybody, when I went to George Floyd's service in Houston and I looked up and I saw the year he was born, 
that was the year I began to be involved in this issue, and that was 47 years ago. I mean, we've been dealing with this, our ancestors were dealing with this for so many years. But now I feel like, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Finally, people can't say this was just one issue or one incident. We don't know what was happening before the camera was on. No. You watch the torture and the murder of George Floyd take place before your eyes, and it lasted almost nine minutes. You can't ask what happened before the tape went on. And I think that was a real wake-up call to America. So finally, people other than folks that look like us say there's an issue here. You know, um, Congresswoman Bass, I am very hopeful that this bill will make it to the finish line eventually. It is a comprehensive uh, piece of legislation that really provides a roadmap for how we might achieve A to Z overhauling of policing in our country. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about the impact that it's having at the local and state level, because the one thing that I have observed is that it's not just sitting, that people are actually taking this and starting to do some work uh, at the grassroots level in their communities to push for an end to racial profiling, to create databases, uh, to track police officers, to end qualified immunity. It seems that uh, this bill really has sparked discussion around issues that um, haven't always been a part of the day-to-day -day conversation of, uh, of policing reform. Absolutely. You know, one of the most important things to me is that people watch these incidences occur, but they don't understand what the solution is to make it stop. And so I think what the bill did was all the different aspects of the bill, it showed what the problem was, like qualified immunity. I mean, when that man was killing George Floyd, he was looking at the camera. His hand was in his pocket. He was acting with complete impunity because he said, hey, I know I don't have to worry about anything here. Fortunately, this time was different. But people didn't realize that before. People didn't know the fact that the reason why officers always get off is because the bar to prosecute them is so high it can never be met. But you can change that and you can lower the bar. People didn't realize about the database. I mean, the day we passed uh, the bill was on Tamir Rice's 18th birthday. And he would have been alive if there had been a database where bad officers wouldn't be able to bounce around. And then a chokehold. I mean, that's torture. Why would you even do that? Why would you have a no-knock warrant? And so I think that the bill pointed out areas of policy that needed to change. Because what I worry about is, is that I don't want people to think that there's no solution, that you just say, stop police brutality, and then you expect everything to change. No. There are certain areas of policy that can be passed, legislated, then of course it has to be enforced, and people have to know that that law has changed, but there, there are solutions to these problems, and it's very important. Otherwise, people become demoralized and hopeless. Well, absolutely. Well, Congresswoman Karen Bass of California, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, we certainly thank you for all the work that you do. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, also fighting on behalf of those of us in black media. That's important as well, ensuring that uh, we get our fair share of those dollars uh, and the Congressional Black Caucus and all the work that y'all do as well. Thank you for the work that you guys do. Appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. All right. Again, so better up. Who's next? Well, I think now we're going to go back to Hill Harper. Yep. Um, who is going to help us recognize our Kennedy Justice Award honoree, Robert F. Smith. Hill? Hey, Roland and, and Kristen. This program has just been fantastic. It's been spectacular uh, listening to the, to the wisdom and the, the, the energy of, of, of everybody. And so moving this along to... Uh, our next amazing recipient. It is now my honor to present Mr. Robert Smith, 2020 recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy Justice Prize. In 2014, in conjunction with the Kennedy family, the Lawyers Committee established the Kennedy Prize to recognize an individual who has demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to racial and social justice, honoring Robert Kennedy's pivotal work as Attorney General and, and, and Senator from New York in the fight for equal rights. He joins a highly regarded list of previous recipients of this award that include Venerable Attorney William Zabel, Congressman John Lewis, 
and former Attorney General Eric Holt. This year, we recognize Robert Smith, founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. In addition to his firm, Mr. Smith is the founding director and president of Fund2 Foundation. Started in 2014, the foundation provides grants to fund efforts that can serve African-American experiences and culture for future generations, rectify human rights abuses, promote music education for young people, and protect the environment through advocacy and awareness of the benefits of the outdoors and uphold the vital American values such as empowerment, innovation, and security for all. You may also remember that in 2019, uh, Mr. Smith, and I, and I wish he'd actually done this at my graduation, um, <laughs> that, that he made headlines by announcing in his commencement address that, that he would cover the student loan debt for nearly 400 students in the graduating class of Morehouse College. Uh, uh, just an, an amazing, amazing gesture. Uh, Mr. Smith's legacy demonstrates an earnest commitment to education, justice, and the black experience in America. And, and you know, Ben Crump did mention his fraternity, Omega Psi Phi, and that, that uh, uh, he was a member and, 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 and Judge Higginbotham was a member. And I must say that, that Robert Smith uh, is a member of, of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, he, he, he represents the shield quite well. And as my pastor and, um, and good friend would always say, there are four keys to a world changer, love, power, authority, and generational wealth. And I think that, that Robert Smith, Brother Robert Smith represents all that. He also has a great wine collection, y'all. His taste in <laughs> wine isn't quite as sophisticated and ele his palate's not to the elevation of, of, of your, of, you know, of, of me, but, but, but his, 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 his cellar is probably bigger than mine. Uh, but that's, you know, that's okay. Size does matter in some cases, um, but taste matters too. So, hey, give it up, please. Uh, we recognize his incredible leadership and commitment to justice for the Robert F. Kennedy Justice Prize. Please roll the video. Thank you so very much for this great honor. The work of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law feels very personal to me and deeply woven in my own story. That famous and infamous summer of 1963 when the committee was founded at the urging of President Kennedy, I traveled as a baby, in my mother's arms across the country from Denver to Washington, D.C. to be there for the March on Washington. I was too young, of course, to remember that day or that year that changed America in such profound ways, but I carry it with me in my bones and in my heart. The popular depiction of the civil rights movement is that change came from dramatic moments. March on Washington, linking arms across the Pettus Bridge. A woman refusing to give up her seat on the bus. But the, what the lawyers who were the foot soldiers of that time know is that a movement is won when the spotlight is off and the cameras aren't rolling. Constance Baker Motley is one of the valiant warriors who I learned about growing up. She led the fight initially for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund to integrate a number of Southern universities and open up schools and parks to African Americans. Even as she faced indignities by other Americans and the very judicial system she was a part of, she remained focused and determined to manifest equal justice under law. After a stint as Manhattan Borough President, she was appointed to the Southern District of New York and focused the rest of her career on dismantling discrimination wherever it presented it itself. As importantly, she mentored and trained numerous young lawyers, many of them African-American women, to summon the courage to take on the toughest cases in hostile and unfriendly environments to dismantle the systemic racism in America. Remembering the lessons of the courageous unsung heroes like Constance Motley of the 60s is so important in our time as we face our own challenges and affronts to equal justice and truth. Remembering the lessons of the courageous unsung heroes of the 60s is so important in our time as we face our own challenges and affronts to equality, justice, and truth. My life story is possible because of lawyers like Constance Motley, elected officials like Andrew Young, Shirley Chisholm, and community activists like Fannie Lou Hammer, who pride opened windows of opportunity for me that they never had for themselves. And as I think about what I can do today, what we all must do today, my answer is that we must pry open as many doors and windows as we can. 
I call this liberating the human spirit. It's empowering more people with the tools to believe that more is possible. Today, right now, that means understanding that social justice and economic justice are inextricably linked. We need to reverse economic policies that have been baked into our system and have created racism in this country for decades. The public and private sectors need to start investing in communities of color that are systemically starved of resources. The largesse of the federal government's response to corporate bailouts during the pandemic needs to start finding its way to the small businesses that are the backbone of the minority communities. We need to end the broadband deserts, the healthcare deserts, and the food deserts that starve people of the basic resources and services they need to live healthy and successful lives. We all need to help, to help move them from dialogue to action. And that's why this award means so much to me. The Lawyers Committee has always been about tangible progress, sometimes dramatic, sometimes incremental, that adds up to a nation that is closer to living its ideals. You are the living legacy of John and Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, and Constance Motley. I wanna thank you all, and I'm honored to stand with you. Thank you very much. All right, Alpha Man Robert Smith, we certainly appreciate it. Economic uh, is important. Economics are important, certainly, when you talk about uh, inequality in this country and economic justice. And that's also part of the work the Lawrence Committee does. It is. And, um, you know, this is actually an area where we've de dedicated a lot of resources, really thinking about all of the factors that contribute to an economic inequality faced by black people in our country. Um, one of the things that we took on at the outset of the year was really trying to understand how was the pandemic impacting black people. Right. And so to talk about that work, I want to turn the floor over to Darielle Rodriguez, who is the director of our Economic Justice Project. Hi, I'm Darielle Rodriguez, director of the Economic Justice Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Our country is currently facing two grueling crises an economic recession, and a health pandemic, both of which are disproportionately impacting black communities and communities of color. At the same time, our country is having a national reckoning and is finally having a long overdue conversation about white supremacy and systemic racism in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and other incidents of police brutality. The Lawyers Committee has long been at the forefront of fighting for racial justice, and our work continues to be critically important. In the past few months, we have pivoted our work to respond to the longstanding racial health inequities that have been laid bare by the pandemic. After the pandemic hit, state and federal governments were not reporting COVID-19 information along lines of race and ethnicity. We decided to do something about that. We joined forces with a coalition of black medical professionals and pushed the CDC, the HHS, and state governments to begin reporting COVID-19 test, case, and mortality information along lines of race and ethnicity. We thank you for your support and we look forward to working with you side by side to advance justice and equality for all. All right, we surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Folks, one of the stories that we've been covering for the last decade has been the HBCU case out of Maryland where they've been suing the state to ensure equitable funding uh, for the state's four HBCUs. Well, Mike Jones uh, is a lead attorney of that case. He sits on the board of the Lawyers Committee, and here's his message uh, in this virtual gala. Hello, my name is Mike Jones, and I'm a partner at Kirkland & Ellis LLP, and a member of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Executive Committee. One of my heroes is Frederick Douglass. One of Douglass's heroes was my great-grandfather, Floyd Washington, who fought against the Confederacy as a part of the United States Colored Division 76th Infantry. Historians describe seeing this unit engage Confederate forces, quote, charging like mad. Retreat was not an option. In today's battle for racial justice, the same is true. Retreat is not an option. My name is Michael Jones, a sophomore at Morehouse College, and we must continue to fight to show that Black Lives Matter. Retreat is not an option. 
retreat is not an option. Absolutely right, folks. Don't forget to use the hashtag Justice2020. Uh, uh, Christian, this is the case, again, when you talk about the work of the Lawyers Committee. This has been going on more than a decade, 13 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we got very close. The legislature actually passed a bill that would provide an adequate settlement to address the decades of harm done to HBCUs in Maryland. But Governor Hogan is uh, right now blocking. Yeah, he vetoed final... it. He yeah. vetoed it, then yeah. claiming didn't have the resources, but they gave millions to redo the racetrack in Baltimore. <laughs> exactly. We are going to keep fighting. Along with Michael Jones, we have been fighting for over a decade, so we will keep fighting. We think that this case can provide a roadmap for how we achieve equity for HBCUs all across our country. So we're not going to we're not going to stop fighting on this one. I want to bring Hill Harper back into this next conversation. We talk about fighting voter suppression uh, is one of uh, the big issues that we still are impacted by. We are in the middle of uh, voting right now. Ballots already went out to North Carolina. Early voting is going to be starting. Uh, and so y'all are really real. How are you geared up to deal with uh, what we already are seeing massive attacks on the uh, mail-in voting, um, uh, early voting sites. Uh, I just read a story where the, where the Trump folks are already trying to sue New Jersey to keep them from counting mail-in ballots early. I mean, I mean, th th there is a, and they are lining up lawyers. There's a syst They are planning a systematic legal attack on the election. Yeah. on November 4th. Yeah. I keep saying this because I believe it. It is literally like we are being dragged back into the Jim Crow era. And um, the, you know, the pandemic has upended elections in our country, and this is one of the biggest areas of work for us at the Lawyers Committee, and it's also the area where Hill Harper has been really integral in lifting up um, just the importance of exercising the right to vote. But Fighting voter suppression is one of our top priorities at the Lawyers Committee. We have filed about a two dozen lawsuits since the start of the pandemic, and we're fighting states that are taking the stance that fear of COVID is not a basis to get access to an absentee ballot. We're fighting states like Mississippi that are for forcing voters to notarize their ballots um, in order for them to count. We're fighting states like Indiana, that, interestingly enough, just adopted a new law in time for November 2020 that says you can't go to court on Election Day to get an extension of poll hours. I mean, you name it, we have seen it this <laughs> season. So if so, I mean, that's the craziness, Hill. So if, if there are technical malfunctions with machines, normally what happens is folks go to court to extend it. They're trying to say, oh, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to usurp that. And again, and this is where we spend lots of time on these issues uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered because people need to understand all of the ways uh, folks are trying to keep others from voting. And, and I'll tell you, there are all the, the, the systemic and legal-based voter suppression issues that the Lawyers Committee does so well at addressing and, and all the things that are very covert and hidden and all of the things that the Lawyers Committee grabs and is able to address. But, but to be quite honest, on the, you know, on the ground, the scariest part of voter suppression also has to do with the misinformation and disinformation through the multiple social media platforms and all of that to actually keep people from voting, to make them believe that, one, their vote doesn't matter at all, number two, that they're not even eligible to vote, and number three, that it'll be too difficult for them to vote, number four, that they shouldn't vote because it doesn't matter or why or they're just too bad, you know, the candidates who are on the ballot, et cetera. You know, and we have to fight that. And folks, and the way we've been talking about it is obviously call 866 our vote so that because the, that that voter line is open now so folks can figure out are they registered properly how they can vote early potentially and have multiple plans about voting meaning plan to vote early yes do that but if it looks like that's not working or if you if you need an absentee ballot you haven't received it have an alternative plan about how your vote is going to count. Don't wait till election day uh, in the afternoon, in the final hours, and say, hey, uh, you know, my vote's not going to count. We can't afford that. We need you to count. We need your vote to count. And again, Kristen, uh, staying on top of all of these different ways 
that they are trying to target folks. Uh, and and again, when you think back to, when you mentioned those Jim Crow days, how every time a judge made a ruling, they would, in Louisiana in particular, they would go back to the legislature and change yep. a law. Yep. Then they would go to court, yep. they would get an injunction, they would do a new law the next yep. day. I mean, th those are the sort of games being played. That's what we're seeing now. And we're up against well-funded, hostile groups right. that are all about waging war to make it harder for people to vote. And Hill is right. We have people right now staffing the 866 Our Vote hotline. You can also text 866 Our Vote. We're here to make sure people know how to get hands on an absentee ballot. We're here to make sure they know whether or not they can vote early in their state and have all the information that they need to vote on Election Day. But we also want people to report the shenanigans, the complaints, right. the voter suppression. That's going to be really key between now and November. Third. All right, folks, we're almost done, folks, almost done. Uh, now we have a, a special message uh, from somebody who uh, y'all are quite familiar with. You've seen her a few times on television. It is an honor and a privilege to serve as co-chair of the board of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, beginning in January of 2020. I could not have known when my term began what a challenging year this would be. I did not foresee the pandemic with its starkly disparate impact on people of color and the threat it has posed to free and fair elections. The words voter protection takes on new meaning when people are fearful of voting in person. And I did not foresee that this would be the year in which the cries for racial justice would finally be heard and criminal justice reforms are now at the forefront of the social and political agenda. I am proud to say that the Lawyers Committee has been at the forefront, both in fighting for racial justice and for protecting everyone's right to vote. I joined with the Lawyers Committee staff in the annual commemoration of the Selma March. That was a powerful experience. Knowing that I stood and marched where the brave leaders of a movement marched 55 years ago is something I will never forget. The inspiring remarks that day from John Lewis and so many others will stay with me forever. Elections have consequences. The hundreds of federal judges that this president has appointed are overwhelmingly white and male and very conservative. The majority of most of the federal appellate courts now consist of Trump appointed judges. Their decisions reflect their biases. They have tried to cut back on abortion rights, have failed to protect immigrants, have tried to invalidate Obamacare, have allowed Trump to build his wall without congressional funding, have failed to respect Congress's right to issue subpoenas to members of the executive branch, have endorsed Trump's interference in criminal cases pending in federal courts, and have consistently tried to skew the results of the census. In some of these examples, the full appellate court or the Supreme Court, by one vote I note, has saved the day. But one more vote there could spell the end of any restraint on the new crop of Trump appointed judges causing ever more damage to our democratic institutions. My uh, bad, I thought it was Judge Judy. Uh, it's another Shanlin. <laughs> that was Judge Shira Shinlin, who used to serve in the Southern District of New York. And um, she actually presided over the NYPD stop mm -hmm. and frisk case. And uh, she took off her robe and left the bench so that she can be of service in the fight for racial and social justice. We're really pleased and proud to have her serve as a co-chair of the board at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. All right, then. We're almost done. We're almost done. Uh, and so let's wrap it up. Well, um, it's been a great, uh, a great day. Uh, we've had an amazing uh, roster of honorees. And I just want to thank you, Roland, uh, for being a part of this special 
uh, celebration. I appreciate it. Well, look, we, you know, we're always about, uh, you know, doing the work and, of course, uh, the ability to be able to uh, reach out to our um, uh, viewers is important. So folks have been watching. We also want them to respond as well. Use the hashtag Justice2020. We also want you to give uh, to the Lawyers Committee. Go ahead and again, folks, the number to call is a two, excuse me, the text LCCRUL to 202-858-1233. Uh, 202-858-1233. That's L-C-C-R-U-L. Or go to the Lawyers Committee website, donate. They need the resources. And what we want to see, we want to see uh, $50,000 raised uh, from all the various streams giving. Let's do that so we can make the, make the work possible. Now, there's making the work possible and the work that we do. And then there's the work that you do, lifting up our stories and shining a light on racial injustice and telling the stories that don't get told in mainstream media. So our last award of the evening goes to you, All right. Roland Martin. Cool. Our champion award. Thank you for always speaking truth to power and I for all of the it. work that you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> it. You're going to sit this right here. <laughs> Well thank, you, well, thank you so very much. Of course, uh, glad, glad to do this with my frat brother, Hill Harper, all the work he's doing as an ambassador for the Lawyers Committee. Uh, and so uh, that's what it's all about, using our skill set uh, to make our community better, Hill. So I certainly yeah, appreciate fantastic. this. And this is just, this, this program has been so inspiring to, to, to hear this and to listen. And, and it gives, hopefully gives us a good energy uh, to power us through, through uh, early November and beyond. And so thank you for the work you do, Brother Roland. And, and Kristen, you are a hero uh, and, and the tireless work you do. And, and folks need to understand this, is that um, Kristen gets attacked uh, repeatedly, regularly. She, uh, on social media, she gets threatened repeatedly and regularly on social media. Um, her security and and is is she puts herself out there in a way that puts her own personal security in jeopardy, and folks have to understand that this isn't just um, somebody who sits back and 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 just throws out a few tweets. Um, she is out there being public about the work that she's doing, and she is repeatedly and consistently on a daily basis threatened. An attack, and so we need to hold her up. We need to wrap our hands around and arms around her and her safety and security, and make sure that we uh, are the antithetical voice to those who are threatening her and the work that she does. Um, and so we're so very proud of you, and thank you for your commitment. Hill Harper, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hill. And uh, you know, the threats are just a reminder that you're doing the right. Thing. That's right. Um, but um, I would be remiss if it, I did not lift up and recognize the amazing work of my team mm -hmm. at the Lawyers Committee who fight so hard each and every day to promote racial justice across our country in partnership with our amazing board members. Absolutely. So we're going to end the show uh, showing you some of that as well as thanking the sponsors of this virtual gala again. Uh, we wish, of course, we could have been uh, with a normal gala, but uh, because of COVID, uh, we had to go virtual. And so we want to thank uh, everyone for the participation, all of you for watching, also for our Roland Martin Unfiltered staff uh, for making this uh, all possible as well, working with the Lawyers Committee. Folks, thank you so very much. Don't don't forget to support the Lawyers Committee, support that work, LCCRUL. Text that to 202 858 1233 so you can financially support the work that they do. Uh, Kristen, we look forward to uh, hopefully getting together yes. uh, in New York for the 21st gala of the Higginbotham uh, Awards. Hope so. Let's hope so. Thank you. All right, it's been thanks amazing. a bunch, folks. Holla! Groovy, groovy. They're on.
Thank you.